Hello there, I'm Barbara Serra, standing in for Richard Gisbert. You're at the listening post. We're going heavy on Iraq this week. There's sectarian fighting across the country on television screens and the airwaves. Ten years since the toppling of Saddam Hussein's statue, we take you inside the event and the coverage of that story. Egypt's leading English language paper, Egypt Independent, is no longer on the newsstands. And hello, Ohio. President Obama takes a leading role in the latest satirical video produced by the White House. For nearly six months now, clashes between Sunni and Shia Muslim groups have been erupting across Iraq. The most recent violence in the north of the country has left nearly 200 people dead. This is a story that is as political as it is sectarian, and now there's a media angle to it. On April 28th this past week, the Iraqi government revoked the operating licenses of 10 satellite channels, nine of them domestic, the 10th one being Al Jazeera Arabic. The National Communication and Media Commission, or the CMC, accused the broadcasters of inciting and escalating the violence. All but one of the channels are aligned with Sunni financial backers, and the government's move is being seen as a crackdown on dissent by Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki's majority Shia government. Our starting point this week is Iraq and its factionalized media landscape, where news outlets are not only caught in the crossfire, but have taken sides in the battle. The Listening Post's Flo Phillips reports. It's a jungle, really. It's a media jungle in Iraq, and it has been like that for many years now. The big problem with media in Iraq today is that it is mostly politically owned. So there is no real uh, independent media in Iraq. There's a very clear division between what the government wants people to say in response to government policies and government actions, and then that which is reported by so much of the rest of Iraqi media. These facts on the ground are brutal. They are not good news, and the government is not happy about it. This isn't the first time there's been bad news out of Iraq. But in late April, when government forces cracked down on Sunni protesters, killing 27 people, it set the airwaves alight. Within a week, Iraq's Communications and Media Commission issued an order suspending 10 satellite channels for, quote, a convulsive and undisciplined media message which exceeded all professional limits and levels to be observed by broadcasters. The channels maintain they were reporting the facts. The government stuck to its line. The division in Iraqi media is obvious. There are some channels that don't see anything positive in Iraq. Everything is just ruins and destruction. They paint a picture of Iraq as being stuck in the Middle Ages. If you live in Baghdad, you will see that life here is better than in Damascus and in Cairo. But the picture portrayed by the media, for sectarian and political reasons, has done a lot of damage to the image of Iraq. If you look at recent events with the government crackdown on the protesters, uh, specifically killing of unarmed protesters, Baghdadia and Sharkia, if you watch their coverage, they're going to have demonstrators on camera talking about what happened. Being killed by uh, Iraqi government forces, this is exactly the message the Communications and Media Commission he does not want these outlets to be broadcasting because it refutes the government's claims that these people are all terrorists. The decision to close down the offices of Al Jazeera and to revoke the licenses of others is a panic decision. The Communication Media Commission is only a tool in the hands of government to control the press. They don't want the bad news to come out. استخدمت القوات الحكومية المروحيات ما أدى إلى مقتل وإصابة مدنيين. The ironic thing on the day of the massacre, some pro-regime stations was covering a music and poetry and culture festival in Al Basra, whilst every other station is covering the events in Al Huayja. I mean, how cynical you can be! Iraq's media landscape is populated by hundreds of newspapers and broadcasters, each one bankrolled by different political and religious groups. These young media outlets were birthed in the shadow of the US-led war, and they bear the scars of that troubled past. The media doesn't represent two simple fronts. 
uh, Shiites or Sunnis. Uh, it doesn't work like that. There are political differences and infightings between the Shiites, and so are they between the Sunnis as well. The Iraqi media represents, enforces, and cements the political differences and the ongoing political games. Our media lack objectivity. We have media outlets whose aim is to deliver anything but the truth. They deliberately provoke sectarian divisions. When some satellite channels look for a thrill, they slip down this dangerous slope. Those that do try to operate somewhat more independently and in a less sectarian method, who are unafraid to question the government policies and sometimes even be critical of government policies, they are the ones that are the most often attacked, as well as the ones that suffer the most consequences from the government itself, as well as the CMC. So this is a, a big problem that if you're operating independently and trying to be less biased, you're actually penalized and attacked more. A decade since the US-led invasion of Iraq, the country is still ranked one of the most dangerous places for the media. In 2011, the Iraqi parliament passed a journalist protection law that was immediately condemned by media watch groups inside and outside the country. They said the law achieved exactly the opposite of what it promised in the title. It made conditions more restrictive and potentially more dangerous for journalists. Less than a month ago, the offices of Al Dustur Al Jadida newspaper and Al Mustaqilla newspaper and a couple of other newspapers were attacked, their computers were smashed, editors and journalists were hit by sticks and knives and nobody done anything about it. There's one journalist I, I've interviewed in Iraq named Yasser Faisal, and he said basically, if you're a journalist operating in Iraq today and you report a story that's critical of the government in any way, you're going to risk one of two things. You're either going to be uh, detained or you're going to be assassinated. Their reporting is certainly biased today, oftentimes out of their own personal survival. The unrelenting pressures on Iraq's journalists have made for a dysfunctional media. However, though it may be battered, journalism in Iraq is not entirely broken. Media in Iraq, even if it's, if it's biased to a certain degree, even if it's aligned with political entity, is still uh, functioning to a certain degree. Uh, media still exposes corruption. Media still puts politicians in a very difficult seat. Media still monitors the work of the public institutions. Media still raises a lot of questions. All the government factions, they are all scared of media today. And they definitely try to manipulate media. I don't believe it has worked. I think the political landscape in Iraq is so diverse and the media is so diverse that it is impossible to control it. Our Global Village voices now on Iraq's divided media. Iraq is a country of many political and religious denominations. Many of the media outlets caters to the views of its target audience and is often critical of the government. But for Nouri al-Maliki's party, it's currently at its most fragile. So it is very likely that the suspension of media outlets is an attempt to quell public dissent and to minimise uh, criticism of its handling of Iraq's affairs. Iraq's media is like many other countries in that it is very partisan. That's because specific TV stations, radio stations and newspapers are connected to political parties, the government or ethno-sectarian groups. Their coverage of events in the country reflect that. For example, the state-run television will emphasize the war against terror and the capture of insurgents. Studies, however, have shown that Iraqis watch a wide variety of media outlets and are very skeptical. That means they do not take everything they read, hear or see for granted. We're always looking for new faces for the program. If you'd like to share your thoughts on the media as one of our Global Village voices, get in touch with us on Facebook or send us a tweet. Our Twitter handle is at AJ Listening Post. Also, don't forget our free video podcast on iTunes. Just look for Listening Post Al Jazeera English and you'll find us there. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. The latest murder of a journalist in Mexico has sent a chilling message to reporters there. You don't have to be covering the drug story to be targeted by the cartels. On April 24th, the dismembered bodies of photojournalist Daniel Martinez Basaldua and another man were found in the northern city of Saltillo. A handwritten note indicated the notorious drug gang, the Setas, were involved in the murder. 
Basil Dua was just one month into a job covering social events for the Vanguardia newspaper. But state officials say the murder note suggested he had deserted from a drug gang. That allegation was rejected by Vanguardia. The paper wrote, We think it is sad and alarming that authorities condemn murdered people, converting them into criminals without offering the least evidence. The country's drug problem has become the deadliest beat for reporters there, and the majority of the murders go unpunished. It has become such a pressing issue that Mexico's Congress recently passed a bill that would allow journalists to request federal investigations into attacks on them and would make crimes against press freedoms a federal offense. The bill has been sent to President Enrique Peña Nieto for his signature. The online information war over Syria used to be dominated by anti-Assad activists and citizen journalists, but the counteroffensive led by the pro-Assad Syrian Electronic Army has been gaining ground. Over the past months, the Dubai-based hackers have successfully targeted the Twitter accounts of many high-profile Western media organizations. The most recent victim was the UK's Guardian, which had 11 of its Twitter accounts taken over. Earlier in April, the group hacked into the Associated Press's Twitter account, posting this message on their feed. The Syrian Electronic Army, or SEA, have been conducting attacks on Arab and Western media outlets since 2011. They say it's part of their campaign against organizations that report fabricated news about what is happening in Syria. The group's modus operandi is to send fake emails that trick people into entering their account passwords that are then picked up by the hackers. In the aftermath of these attacks, Twitter reportedly started test-running a new security system to make such hacks impossible. In Egypt, a leading English-language newspaper has suddenly stopped publication. Egypt Independent was widely read both inside and outside the country and was regarded as an important critical voice. The paper was published under the banner of the Al-Masri Media Corporation, which also publishes the widely read Arabic paper Al-Masri al yum The company's management cited financial reasons for the closure. Chairperson Abdel Moneim Saeed likened his role to that of a surgeon who has to conduct the fine operation of letting go of the child in order for the mother to survive. Lina Atalla, former editor of Egypt Independent, shot back in a letter. It is a fine operation indeed, if only Al Masri's survival was conditional on our closure and not a much needed reinvigorating and rigorous review of its institutional practice. Supporters of the paper claim it was shut down because of its sustained criticism of the Morsi government and its championing of what they call the true spirit of the revolution. The Egypt Independent team says its final edition was banned from going to press, so they made a downloadable copy available online. In nearly one year of Mohamed Morsi's presidency, journalists and media outlets in the country have said that they continue to operate under very challenging conditions. Financial pressures have been acute, but the situation is made worse, they say, by increasing government intolerance and self-censorship. On April 9, 2003, less than a month after the U.S. invasion of Iraq had begun, television screens around the world broadcast an event taking place in Firdos Square, in the center of Baghdad. The footage showed a statue of Saddam Hussein being pulled down amidst a crowd of cheering Iraqis and triumphant American soldiers. The pictures fit neatly alongside the spin from the Bush White House. It symbolized the end of a war that in fact had only just begun. Since then, analysts have theorized that the event was a classic example of military manipulation of the media, but the reality is much more complex. Ten years since that made-for-TV moment grabbed headlines around the world, we're going back to analyze the event, the media coverage of it, and the symbolism of the pictures. The Listening Post's Nicholas Muirhead on the day the statue fell and why the story played as it did. The war was three weeks old. There was an air of trepidation over Baghdad. Iraqis did not know what remained of Saddam Hussein's regime. Invading forces did not know what resistance they would face. And just the day before, journalists lost two colleagues in a US airstrike. That's how the day began on April 9th, 2003. The decision to go to war in Iraq was one of the most controversial decisions in, in, our, in our lifetime. 
in terms of foreign policy. The US-led coalition had to have a few very visible, immediate, uh, tangible wins. As the day wore on and the sense of inevitable euphoria developed amongst the small number of people that were there, they wanted to demonstrate that they realized that this incredible moment had arrived. And the most obvious thing that was there in front of them was this statue. Because there were so many journalists there, they were able to broadcast basically immediately to go live. So that made the event global, even though the event itself wasn't the most important thing happening in Baghdad at the time, because there was still a lot of combat going on, and there was a lot of looting going on, which was probably the best indicator of the future that Iraq was going to have, a difficult, really problematic future, as opposed to one with statues being happily toppled. The symbolic ending of this. Today, the How the event was reported fit perfectly with what the Bush administration had been saying in the lead-up to the invasion. Military operations. That the war would be over quickly, that U.S. forces would be greeted as liberators, and that Saddam Hussein's regime would promptly be replaced with a new democratic government. The world from grave danger. They were bold assertions in need of validation. The statue helped. 24-hour news is a giant echo chamber. And when you introduce something that is a partial truth or a myth, it bounces around this echo chamber and creates a universal truth that people accept. The statue of Saddam Hussein comes tumbling down. You replay it thousands of times within a few hours. That is the image that you get. The scenes of free Iraqis celebrating in the streets, riding American tanks, tearing down the statues of Saddam Hussein in the center of Baghdad are breathtaking. We need to distinguish between American public diplomacy requirements for their audiences back at home. From the Iraqi perspective, very few Iraqis had actually seen that image on the day or indeed in the, in the following few days. It was only later on that that became iconic. So this image primarily served as a, as a moment for the Western media. There were a lot of other statues that actually had been torn down and murals of Saddam Hussein that had been defaced by the US military throughout the entire invasion. Um, but there wasn't a large number of media there and it wasn't in the center of Baghdad. So the presence of the media at Firdos Square was absolutely key. If the media hadn't been there and the statue had been taken down, it would have been like the tree falling in the forest that you know nobody's aware of because nobody's there to see it. Another iconic moment from that day was when a US soldier placed an American flag over the statue's head. For many, it was a display of U.S. jingoism played out for the world's media, but not according to the flag's owner. It belonged to Lieutenant Tim McLaughlin, the commander of the first U.S. tank to reach the square. Ten years later, he collaborated with two journalists who covered the war in an exhibition in New York, in part to give his account of the events in Furdu Square. The presence of the media didn't affect anything that I did. Um, I had tried to take a picture of my personal flag in a personal way uh, twice before. Um, we got shot at once, so that was a bad idea. And my company commander said, hey, Lieutenant Mack, we've got a moment where we might be able to get a picture of your flag here for you. That was truly it. I understood the media was there. I did not understand that they were filming it for a live worldwide audience. The flag, the statue, the euphoria broadcast all over the world. It seemed too good to be true. And conspiracists have since theorized that it was just a masterful piece of wartime propaganda. But what really happened that day was more a perfect storm of circumstance. Much of the international media was staying at the Palestine Hotel, also in Furdu Square. So there was no shortage of journalists that day to transmit images that would soon become visual shorthand for mission accomplished. Also involved in the exhibition in New York is journalist Peter Maas, who was there when the statue came down. In 2010, he did an in-depth investigation for the New Yorker magazine about what really happened in Furdu Square. What he found was not that the event was staged for the media, but that the media helped stage the event. You can see the journalists, the photographers, the TV cameramen cluster around these Iraqis. And you can see how the Iraqis become more excited, gesturing more, shouting louder, the more cameras there are around them. So they are interacting and reacting to the cameras themselves. That's kind of like a, a, a latent effect that the mere presence of the cameras had. People were reacting to the cameras rather than kind of creating authentic events themselves without regard for what was happening around them. To this day, the toppling of the statue is one of the most referenced visuals of the war. But what happened that day, what was shown, provided no hint of the resistance and insurgency that was still to come. 
and the media's saturation coverage of a televisual act of defiance symbolized something that proved to be misleading. Whilst this image of a mission accomplished was being put out, the basis of the insurgency was already being laid. So I think the war and the coverage of the war continued uh, as it started, which is one in which there was a lack of willingness to really take a critical look at every aspect of the war. That lessened and lessened as the occupation went on, as the reality of the war began to sink in, the realization that the fall of Baghdad was actually the end of the beginning and not the beginning of the end. It also signified an error, a kind of inbuilt error of the media, which is to try to create these pretty images that fit a narrative that are convenient, that are easy, that don't require a lot of um, you know, activity to go out into the city and see what else is going on, a kind of laziness. And it signified that because we know now that it was wrong. I understand that the world saw something and had many different feelings about it, and all of those feelings are correct. But for me, it was just an event that was preceded by a lot of blood and death and violence and killing in combat. And that's the disconnect that frustrates me so much. A symbolic media clip. Goodbye, Saddam. Versus the reality of the rest of the world for the people who are affected by war. In a decade of war, certain images will inevitably be etched into memory. Some get there because of their significance others because of the significance they are given. More Global Village voices now on the media event that was the toppling of Saddam Hussein's statue. I think the biggest problem with the way the media perceived the fall of the statue is that for them this signified the, the, the very end of the war itself and subsequently for the Western viewer marked the time when Iraq was already in the hands of the Americans. And so after that, those people who were still protesting the occupation and still fighting against the occupation were considered terrorists and they are making trouble in the new Iraq. History is filled with iconic moments. The American media had hoped that the toppling of the statue of Saddam Hussein would become one of these moments, a moment which symbolized the liberation of the Iraqi people, ushering in a new era of peace and democracy. The reality, however, has been far different, and violence has continued for years, long outliving the media's desire to cover it. And finally, every year, American politicians, political reporters, and White House spin doctors get together for the Schmooze Fest that is the annual White House Correspondents' Dinner. The highlight of the event is the President's Address, which is part comedy, part cringe. And almost every year, since the launch of YouTube, it's made it to the top of the viral charts. This year, the President ended his speech with a special video featuring Hollywood director Steven Spielberg discussing his latest blockbuster, Obama. We won't spoil it for you, suffice to say that the actor they found to play President Obama is spot on. The spoof has been doing the rounds on the web and we've chosen it as our web video of the week. We'll see you next time right here at The Listening Post. Well, I was thrilled that Lincoln was a success and as I was thinking about what to do next, uh, it, it, in the middle of the night I woke up and it hit me. Obama. I mean, the guy's already a lame duck, so why wait? Picking the right actor to play Obama, that was the challenge. I mean, who is Obama really? We don't know. And as it turns out, the answer was right in front of me all along. Daniel Day-Lewis. He becomes his characters. Hawkeye from Last of the Mohicans and Bill the Butcher from Gangs of New York and Abraham Lincoln in Lincoln. And you know what? He nailed it. Was it hard playing Obama? I'll be honest, yeah, it was. This accent took a while. Hello, Ohio. Hello, Ohio. I love you back. Look, look, let me be clear about this. The cosmetics were challenging. I mean, you wouldn't believe how long it takes to put these ears on in the morning. I don't know how he walks around with these things. The hardest part, trying to understand his motivations. I mean, why did he pursue healthcare first? What makes him tick? Why doesn't he get mad? If I were him, I'd be mad all the time. But I'm not him. I'm Daniel Day-Lewis.